You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Seth Shostak. Since the age of 10, Seth developed an interest in extraterrestrial life when he first picked up a book about the solar system. He has a degree in radio astronomy and is a senior astronomer at the SETI Institute. Dr. Shostak is also keen on outreach activities, interesting the public in science and astrobiology. He's co-authored a college textbook on astrobiology and has written three trade books on SETI. In addition, he's published more than 400 popular articles on science, including regular contributions to NBC News Mac. He gives dozens of talks annually and is the host of the SETI Institute's weekly science radio show, Big Picture Science. Seth Shostak, welcome back to the program. It's great to be here, John. Me so far. Looking for radio signals from alien civilizations, and we've been doing it for quite a while. Give me some sense of how deeply have we actually looked? Now, Jill Tarter once said that it was less than a bathtub in an ocean. Have we exceeded the bathtub yet? Probably we've gone to several bathtubs, but the comparison is still apt. It's like going to Africa, right, in hunting wild game or whatever, and you land in the ship and you've explored about a city block worth of territory. Compared to Africa, that's a rather small sample. And that's pretty much where we are with SETI, too. It's going to be centuries, I think, before we can say, well, if we find something, though, that changes everything. But well, exactly. It's just a matter of how many animals are out there. If there are enough animals on the continent you just landed on, the fact that you've only looked at a very small sample of it doesn't matter. You'll still find something. Now, do we have hope for better efficiency? In other words, we've got targeted radio telescopes that are looking very tiny individual stars looking for any sign of a signal. But can we expand that out? And I know some people are looking into all sky SETI and those types of ideas. Do you see that as the future? Yeah, I think that that's one thing. I mean, obviously, what you want to do is expand the parameter space, as scientists like to call it. In other words, cover more of the sky at any given moment. And also more of the radio frequency band, too. I mean, you know, just cover, if you can, billions of channels at once. And that's possible. In fact, is being implemented. So, And that's always being upgraded, right? In other words, you get, you get, yes. you get a constant flow of increasingly more channels in a, in a wider sample. That's, that's true. That's mostly due to the march of technology, if you will. Primarily the march of computer technology that makes it possible to look at more frequency channels, for example, at once. Now, let me ask you this, uh, just a nuts and bolts question. So take the Allen Telescope Array. Do you, the dishes themselves at some point limit what you can look for as far as frequencies go? Do do they, you eventually leave, does the science eventually leave the capabilities of a uh, of a standard radio telescope? Well, they do. I mean, there are, two, there are several factors there. The, the size of the telescope, the nature of the radio telescope, you know, how big are the individual telescopes, if it's an array, what sort of electronics are connected to the telescopes, all that. All of it is, in, in a sense, lib, uh, limited, also liberating because, <laughs> you know, you, you know what you can do. But any given telescope does have a range of frequencies, radio frequencies, for which you can use it. And so you can't use most radio telescopes for frequencies that are very, very high, for example, or in many cases, even for frequencies that are very low. That depends on the technical uh, characteristics of the instrument you're using. Now, in the frequencies that are most looked at, I, which I assume around 1420 megahertz, in those sorts of frequencies, is there an inherent value to that? In other words, is the, is the universe particularly transparent for such a radio frequency that might drive aliens just as a matter of practicality of using these frequencies? I mean, are there, are there very specific ones that are just good? Well, uh, we think so. I mean, there's a range of frequencies. It's sometimes called the microwave window that is around 1420 megahertz, as you mentioned, 21 centimeters in wavelength that where the the universe is right radio quiet if you will right because the universe produces a lot of radio emission natural radio emission right hydrogen between the stars produces radio noise i mean turn an antenna toward jupiter you'll pick up all sorts of radio noise so there's a lot of radio noise in the universe but we know not only what's causing it but we also know where it is on the dial so it turns out that the Microwave frequencies, say one gigahertz, a thousand megahertz, up to maybe 10 times that, 
that's a relatively quiet part of the universe, if you will, uh, the radio universe. We know that after only you know less than a century of studying the universe with radio telescopes. And the aliens that we're listening for, they presumably know it too. So if they're putting a signal into uh, the ether, if you will, that uh, they want somebody else to pick up, they presumably will put it in a part of the radio dial which is naturally quiet. But also a natural signpost because at the hydrogen line, you've got, as you mentioned, neutral hydrogen emitting radio. Everybody's going to know about that. So even though you have this vast range of frequencies, millions of channels, you can look at certain things and say, well, maybe they'll choose that area if they're intentionally trying to say something. Right. And that they might put it there so everybody knows. All the scientists in the galaxy will know to look there. But there's another interesting idea. I recently read a paper, actually it's probably been several years now, where the idea was floated of piggybacking radio signals on top of celestial events. So in other words, if you see a supernova cook off, look for a signal because the aliens might have timed it <laughs> so that and everybody would know when to look. So what about serendipity as far as signals go? Would we even be able to determine such a thing because it's just so transient? Yeah, well, a lot of these ideas have been cooked up. And the one you mentioned, supernovae, is a particularly good example. Look, uh, you're on some alien planet and a supernova goes off in the sky. Every astronomer on your planet will aim their telescopes of whatever type in the direction of the supernova because supernovae are very interesting phenomena. You want to learn more about them. But some of them might figure, hey, look, we're looking at this supernovae and everybody behind us is going to be looking at that supernovae too, right? Maybe not immediately because they're farther from it, for example, but they will look in the direction of the supernovae. So if they're really behind us, as opposed to in some other direction, if they're really behind us, why don't we just wait half day and turn some transmitters on in the direction behind us and say, hey, you know, while you're studying the supernovae, We'd just like to check in where the Klingons. So that kind of, if you will, special event or special circumstance has also been suggested as uh, something maybe useful to the search for ET. And efficient because you don't need to have a screaming, energy-hungry, omnidirectional beacon running (laughs) 24-7. You just serendipitously place your signal in front of something that everybody's going to see. Right. Now, also, when doing SETI searches, Is the focus specifically on planets? In other words, do you say that star system probably has a planet on it? That's the place we need to look. But could it also simply be that aliens hang out where we're not looking, out in deep space or something like that? And how would you go about looking for that if if that were the case? Yeah, personally, I think that uh, what you just said makes a lot of sense. I mean, we do tend to look in the direction of star systems that are either known to have planets or are the kind of star systems that we've seen have planets in other directions. We, we, we know about, I don't know, four to 5,000 planets around other stars. That's the total. And of course, you could look in the direction of those star systems that have planets. But doggone, the biggest takeaway from the whole study of exoplanets is that most stars have planets. That's kind of simplified the strategy quite a bit because now you don't have to know, well, did does this star system have planets or not? And if they, if it has planets, are they the kind of planets where you might expect life or whatever? You just look at as many star systems as you can because most star systems, maybe 80% of them, have planets. That doesn't mean all these planets are really great places for life, but some of them will be. So that's actually simplified the search quite a bit because now you just look at basically all the nearby stars. So say you get a signal, right? In determining that signal, what it is, which it could just be some alien's internal communication that you'll never figure out, or whatever it is. But what other things, as far as other techno signatures, could you employ? So say you get it, do you then look for the vegetative red edge, or, or what, where do you go from there as far as studying this alien civilization and trying to figure anything you can out about them? Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, if you picked up a signal, say we picked up a signal tonight, right? The coordinates for the star system where we picked up the signal, they would be public knowledge because You know, you have to tell people at another observatory, presumably even in another country, the coordinates for them to check the signal in the first place. So there's nothing secret about where it is on the sky. And you can bet that anybody with any kind of telescope will be looking in that direction. And one thing they might want to find out very quickly, use some big optical telescopes, you know, mirror and lens telescopes, to determine, well, are there planets around that star system? And if so, what what kind? And if, if you 
have have the capability yes you would use very big optical telescopes to try and find that planet and then determine well does it have oxygen in its atmosphere or is there some spectral indication that there's photosynthesis going on on that planet that kind of thing all these studies would of course be pursued and if any of them got anywhere you can be sure there'd be a lot of money made available for building new telescopes that could tell us more now as a natural result of seti and you've done this for a long time are peripheral scientific discoveries made in radio astronomy as a result of seti in other words can you look at a seti data set and see some sort of weird natural signal of which you have to figure out what it is. Has that happened? I, I don't think it actually has happened. And that's somewhat surprising because the history of astronomy, and in particular radio astronomy, was that every time you built an instrument which had a special capability, in the case of SETI radio telescopes, the special ability is the fact that you can look at hundreds of millions, even more channels in that direction. Every time this has happened in the past, where you have that special ability, you find something new and unexpected, whether it's pulsars or quasars. All the, the whole history of astronomy points to the value of serendipity here. But I have to say, despite the fact that we've been doing radio SETI experiments since 1960, I don't know that we've made any astronomy discoveries as a consequence of that. It's interesting because you think it'd be there. I mean, it seems if you're going to look at 1420, well, seems like a good way to study the hydrogen clouds of the Milky Way, doesn't it? Well, yeah, but you would, if, if that's what you want to do, actually, you build an instrument that is a little different than SETI. SETI is just looking for a signal. If you want to study the hydrogen line, because that would tell you things, you build a, a somewhat different receiver. But that's a technical thing. And in fact, of course, there's been a lot of work in studying the hydrogen line coming from the sky. I used to make uh, my, my daily bread by doing stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. You started in the hydrogen area of, of radio astronomy. Do we have a good handle on that yet? Do we, I mean, do we have a really good mapping of that? And I know that, that the Big Ear did that initially before it moved to SETI, but do we have a really, really comprehensive map of the gas of this galaxy now? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, you can always improve it. You can always use new instruments to refine the detail or the sensitivity and things like that. But it's like the maps of the world that were made in 1600, right? They, they weren't perfect. There was a lot of the Canadian Arctic that they didn't know about. Obviously, they didn't know about Antarctica and so forth and so on. But that map, and you could put it on a globe, it was, there, was enough, there were enough data to put on a globe, was pretty good, particularly compared to what, for example, the Romans had, right? So you could say that the majority of the job had been done I think that's somewhat true for the study of the hydrogen line in our galaxy, too. Now, can you collect up information using surveys like that about the motion of that hydrogen? In other words, can you see blue and red shift in the in the signal that tells you that these clouds are moving in a certain way and gives you sort of an idea of the dynamics of the movement of gas in the Milky Way? Yeah, of course. That was realized early on. That was the big advantage of studying the hydrogen line, because if you have a line of any kind, if there's some frequency that signal is at, you generated in the lab, and it's at 1420.4059, whatever, megahertz. If you know that, then it's very easy to see deviations from that rest frequency, that frequency you'd measure in the lab, due to the Doppler shift. The gas is either moving toward you or away from you. And if you couple that with a, just a very simple assumption that all the motions in the Milky Way are kind of circular, that the Milky Way is like, if you will, a record on a turntable, except that this record doesn't all rotate together as one object every bit of gas can rotate at its own orbital speed, then you can map indeed the galaxy, at least in the hydrogen line. And that was done even in the 50s and 60s, that sort of work was done. And it's, for astronomy, it's very interesting because it tells you about the structure of the Milky Way galaxy, which for us, that's our home galaxy, but it's difficult to figure out what it really looks like because we're in it. And that makes it difficult to get the overview. Yeah, that and that a lot of it we can't see. <laughs> now, back to SETI, what is the profile of distance? In other words, do you just not bother with very distant known exoplanets because the chances of a signal getting through are, are low? And do you focus more on nearby worlds first? And is it sort of a moving outward type of thing? What's the map of SETI searches? Well, I mean, there have been some SETI searches that have trained their antennas on things that are very far away, including other galaxies that are very far away. But in general, what you say is true. You just choose your targets on the basis of distance. And the majority of SETI searches have been done on star systems that are within, say, 100 or 200 light years. That's kind of the, uh, the outer edge, if you will, 200 light years of what has been done for SETI. The signals would be stronger, obviously, 
if the aliens are closer. Yeah, well, and we also don't know what their technology is. They may see value in gigantic signals, but they may not. And it may be very, very subtle, which I don't know. Could we say that now that the original idea of Coconian and Morrison, as Rick Hall, was looking for beacons? Can we eliminate that? Can we say, well, we've looked enough and we haven't seen any huge, crazy beacons that must be more subtle? Can we do that? I would say no, but, but that's a judgment call. I don't know that we've so comprehensively looked in all directions. I mean, yeah, there could be signals that we've missed. I mean, they, they could be very nearby, but only have a relatively weak transmitter and we just don't find them. And there's always the function of time and that we may not exist close enough right now in time to see another civilization. But if we look in 50,000 years, there it is. So this is also, there's a function of time here as well as the number of civilizations. So it's not really surprising that at this point we can say we've only still just started looking because we I need to look for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. When people say, why haven't you found anything? That's the reason I give. We haven't looked long enough and hard enough. Yeah, and it's, it shouldn't be surprising that we haven't seen it yet because no. we have a lot of work to do. Now with the Allen Telescope Array, being an array, can you actually look at multiple targets at once? Well, you can do that, but then you need multiple receivers. Normally, what is done is you use all the elements of the array, all those te little telescopes that are dotted on the, uh, you know, dotting the landscape, and you essentially use them as one telescope. The advantage of doing that is that you can focus in on specific spots on the sky, right? So it's not used where each antenna is doing its own thing. Any recent good candidate signals? Now, we, have, we remember BLC-1, which turned out to be interference, but through the, the ATA, any good stuff recently? Well, nothing that I've heard of, I have to tell you that. And I'm, I'm not directly in the data reduction chain, so, you know, I can't say that last night they didn't pick up something. But so far, no. The important point to note here, and it is important, is that every time you use a telescope like this, a radio telescope, and aim it at the heavens and, you know, turn on the receivers, you get signals, you get signals all the time, right? You, you, you can't go a minute without getting a signal. And those signals so far have all been due to Homo sapiens, uh, in particular orbiting satellites, which are beaming down information. And so those are, you know, those are transmitters that are only 200 miles above your head kind of thing, but you have a sensitive system. So you pick those up. Well, what we do is we have procedures in place and equipment in place to check out every signal we pick up before moving on to the next spot on the sky and see, well, look, is this really a cosmic signal or is this just another, if you will, homo sapien signal? So far, they've all been due to us, but it does complicate the search. Thoughts on building a radio telescope on the moon to eliminate homo sapiens as best we can? Yeah, that would be a good idea, particularly if you put it on the back side of the moon. Because if you put it on the back side of the moon, when you think about it, that's the only place in the universe, I guess, where you're shielded from the types of signals that humans produce. Elephant in the room, Starlink and such constellations are, we know the problems with visual astronomy there. Are they a confounding problem for radio astronomy as well? I, I don't think so, not at the moment, because those, again, those signals can be screened out if you have an array of antennas and you're looking in one particular spot on the sky. They, they won't really interfere with you. However, that isn't to say that this isn't a problem because eventually these things can and will interfere with astronomy on the ground. Now, I know that the hydrogen line is set aside for radio astronomy. Are there other areas within radio astronomy that are useful that are, you know, we try to keep them interference free? Yeah, there's actually a range of frequencies that include, of course, the hydrogen line but also lines due to what's called the hydroxyl radical. Uh, that's, that's just a simple molecule of oxygen and hydrogen because that also produces radio signals at a known frequency. And again, ET will know about those too. So we do study the universe at some of these other specific frequencies, not really so much for ET, but just because it tells you something about the distribution of gas in, in the universe. That's, that's of uh, use. It's also been pointed out the hydroxyl radical OH, as it is, oxygen and hydrogen. If you combine that with the hydrogen frequencies, which is just H, you have H2O, which is water. And so that's an interesting coincidence, or maybe not a coincidence, but an interesting fact that suggests its use as sort of an international hailing signal, because we assume that any aliens out there are also going to be water-based. 
Now, in that area of the spectrum, I guess you still hear all kinds of natural interference as well. But has anybody done any work on trying to figure out what that natural interference is? Like, can the magnetic field of a star get disturbed and send a hail of radio energy towards it? You see the big broadband <laughs> sort of swat. I, it just seems to me that that would be an interesting thing to look for in, in, these, in this type of a data set. Well, it's true that there are plenty of natural radio emitters in the sky. I mean, the sun puts out a lot of radio emission. I say a lot. It's only a lot because we're relatively close to the sun. This afternoon, it was only 93 million miles away. That's next door. However, when you're looking at another star system, you're trying to do a SETI experiment, the distance is so vast that the natural emissions from the star or even from planets like Jupiter or Saturn, which produce some radio waves too, that's all gone. It's diluted by the distance to these uh, systems to the point where it's not really a factor anymore in your observation. That's interesting. So the stars can be so distant that they don't really create enough interference. Yeah. So you're, you're looking. And then the other thing, too, is that I guess any interference you see is going to be broadband, right? So you very little narrowband anything. And obviously technology is narrowband. So I guess that it eliminates is. something. So Yeah, no, no, that's a that's a very big discriminant. Yes. And that was the scary thing about the wow signal. The one thing that haunts me to this day is that it was narrowband and it was just inexplicable. Unfortunately, unless we pick it up again, we'll never know. But do you think that's still the strongest candidate? Or do you think that one more was made of it than it should have been? Well, I don't know. I mean, I've talked to the people at Ohio State University where it was picked up. And the bottom line is they don't know either. They never figured out what it was. It is true that uh, the big year telescope at Ohio State there, Columbus, uh, Ohio, which is no more, by the way. I think it's a golf course now. But in any case, it had actually two receivers on it. So if you saw a signal coming from a transmitter that ET was operating on some nearby star system, you would see it twice, first in the in receiver number one and then in receiver number two. Now, they were separated in time, their observations, by about a minute. But the wow signal was seen once, but not the second time. Right? This, it was only seen in one of the receivers. And so how do you explain that in, in terms of it being a, an ET candidate? Well, it would mean that, yeah, ET turned on their transmitter long enough for you to pick it up at the first receiver, but then went on lunch break or something, turned it off so you didn't see it the second time. Either that or it was a glitch in the system that was limited to one of the two frequency channels. Yeah, I actually did know. that. I actually did that early in the, the history of the show. I, I went and tried to find the Ohio State people that were still around. And I got I, I interviewed Jerry Eman and Dr. Dixon, I believe his name was. Yeah, Robert Dixon. Yeah, I did not get to Bob Gray before he unfortunately passed away. But did you ever know Dr. Krauss, who I know was a huge figure in radio astronomy? Did you ever know him? Yeah, uh, well, I knew of him. I don't think I actually met Krauss, but he wrote probably his biggest contribution to the field of radio astronomy was writing a book, a textbook on radio astronomy. Krauss, it's called, by people who have to teach that course. And for a long time, that was essentially the only textbook in the field. It was the leading textbook. Now, the big year was, again, that was at the hydrogen line. But to illustrate the difference between radio astronomy then and now, that thing only had like 50 channels, right? And now it's millions. I mean, how many millions of channels can you simultaneously search? Well, in some sense, there's no limit. It depends on how much compute power you have to throw at the problem. But the best, uh, the best examples in terms of lots of channels, there are, there are receivers now that I think it's like 100 million channels. So that's a lot better than 50. Yeah, it is. And how, how wide is a channel nowadays? I mean, I know like well, the big year was 10 kilohertz or something like that. So what's it look yeah, like? Yeah, one hertz, not a kilohertz, one hertz. So 10,000 times narrower. That's normally what we do. Uh, again, that's uh, mostly a matter of how big a computer you have. You can make the channels any width you want in software, but typically we use one hertz because any signals narrower than one hertz, this was shown many years ago, would actually get smeared out to about a hertz thanks to hot gas between the stars. So there's no point in building receivers that have a narrower frequency resolution, narrower channels, so you start with one hertz. And of course, if the, the signal is wider, for example, a TV signal is not one hertz wide. It's five or six megahertz, that's million hertz wide, right? But if it's wider than one hertz, if the aliens are sending you their TV signal for some reason, you can always combine the channels to produce, if you will, a wider channel 
in software. So as long as you can get down to the level that you think is interesting in the sense of the narrowest signal, then you're okay. And I think we can do that now. Has the rather catastrophic end of Arecibo negatively impacted SETI, or do you see a day where SETI experiments at FAST in China might give us some sort of replacement of that capability? Yeah, yeah. Arecibo had the bad form to collapse a couple of years ago, not many now. They, they still don't know. I, as far as I can tell, I'm, it's not quite clear what's going to happen to the observatory. There still is an observatory. There's an infrastructure there, a museum and offices and so forth, just no telescope. But in principle, the Arecibo telescope could be replaced by the FAST telescope. It, it's a tortured acronym, F-A-S-T, in China. But there's always the question of, well, it's not so easy to go to observe in China, even if you can do it remotely, as it was at Arecibo. There's, you know, there's, there's something to be said for having your own telescope. But other telescopes, I'm sure, will make up for it. And there are also existing radio telescopes, like the Very Large Array, that can do experiments in some ways even more interesting than what you could do with a giant dish like Arecibo. You know, it's the, the curse of the radio telescope because Arecibo is not the first one of those to collapse. I remember the one in West Virginia back in the 1980s <laughs> we lost. And it just goes to show you how big dynamic machines can very easily fail. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that was the 300-foot telescope in Green Bank. And I was really saddened when it, when it collapsed because that was the telescope that I used a lot for studying galaxies. It just became a bunch of scrap metal. And fortunately, nobody was hurt. Got replaced, though. The observatory itself is still functioning, so. Oh, oh, it is. And there is a what's called the GBT, the Green Bank Telescope, which is, I think it's 100 meters. So it's, it's bigger than the old 300 foot by a very slim amount. But that telescope is very capable and, and in a way replaced what collapsed. On the other hand, the 300 foot was just a cheapy telescope built sort of on a whim with some leftover money. And because of that, it was very easy to get a lot of observing time on that telescope. So that capability, in a way, did go away. Leftover money is not something you often hear in science. Particularly not in astronomy. No. Yes. The Galileo Project, looking for technosignatures close by, and I know you're involved with that. And what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you think that we have a better chance looking closer to home for anything, anything we can think of, than looking into deep space? Or do you think just the sampling that's available of deep space of 200 billion stars beats that. Well, I mean, the Galileo project, which is run by Avi Loeb at Harvard, actually, it, the, the premise there is that there could be things very, very nearby, even in our own solar system. Think of a Muamua, for example, that are actually alien artifacts and that they could be proven to be of alien origin if you only had a telescope that was tuned into the right frequencies and looking nearby. Right, because in astronomy, unless you're studying our solar system or some reason to, to look nearby, you, you know, you're interested in Mars or something like that. In general, astronomy looks far away. And so the Galileo project said, look, we need a really good sensitive telescope. And it's actually a series of telescopes that can find things in our own solar system, not just in the radio, but we'll also look at optical uh, frequencies and even more. And you could say, well, it sounds like it's about UFOs, and it may be about UFOs, actually. I mean, there could be some truth in, in these sightings. And if so, this is the kind of instrument you would want to have to, to verify that. I think it's a good thing to do. I, I don't know that it'll find anything on our solar system. Personally, rather skeptical that we're being visited. But until you have the data, you can't say for sure. A null result is just as valuable, because if you find nothing, that tells you something in and of itself. It does. In regards to the UFOs, I admit I'm a skeptic as well, but I'm not a skeptic that people see stuff, weird stuff in the atmosphere. I'm not a skeptic of that. It doesn't strike me as acting particularly alien. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, I don't know what acting alien <laughs> really means. I mean, how do the aliens act? But I mean, a lot of these things are, you know, look, they're like 10, well, it's somewhat smaller now, like 8,000 reported sightings of things in the sky every year. UFOs, if you will. You can call them UAPs if you want to be trendy. Government keeps but, changing it. It's got a new one now, so they keep changing the, <laughs> the designation. So I, 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 yeah, yeah. Let's just go with UFO. <laughs> well, whatever. But the Galileo project is trying to build stuff that would find stuff in, in, in proximity to Earth, very close to us, the kinds of things that people see in the sky and think are aliens shooting around. I think you ought to do that. As I say, I'm rather skeptical. And one of the reasons I'm skeptical, by the way, 
It's not because of the reports. People say, oh, well, you know, these people are honest and so forth. I don't doubt that they're honest, but do they really know what they're, they're seeing? I think one of the big reasons that I'm skeptical that you'll find something is because I don't know that the aliens would spend the money to send probes to our solar system to check us out unless they knew about us. Not possible. And if, well, I mean, they could know about us if they're within, I don't know, 50 or 80 light years because then there's been enough time for the kind of signals we make willy-nilly like radar and TV and stuff like that to reach them so they know, oh, that planet over there, it has some, some sort of life that's able to build technology. And then maybe they do send a probe and, you know, check us out. But there hasn't been enough time, in my opinion, for television and other indications of our presence to get to where the aliens reasonably could be expected to be hanging out and then enough time for them to send a probe back toward us, which also, after all, is limited by the speed of light. It does have to be said, though, and this is this is the reason that I, I bring it up, is that physics doesn't prohibit the presence of an alien civilization here. It's just what may prohibit it is things like spending money or their equivalent of money or spending resources. At the same time, right. though, this biosphere has been screaming weird levels of oxygen and methane for a very long time, much, much, much longer than our own existence. So could it be possible that a von Neumann probe was sent out here sometime in the past that just crossed space time? It's a robot. It doesn't care about the passage of time. And it's just sitting out there purely for scientific reasons, watching the development of this world. And if it's a 3D printer, maybe it prints out a UFO. And if somebody sees that in the atmosphere, well, there is a, you know, a UFO of alien origin. So my point is nothing in physics prohibits it. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to yeah, us. No, you're quite right. It doesn't violate physics to send a probe to somebody else's solar system. Physics doesn't violate the idea that I'm going to walk to Argentina for lunch. I could do it. <laughs> I wouldn't get lunch today, but but I, but I'm not going to do it, right? For, if you will, just practical reasons, the amount of energy required, right? The cost, the time and all that sort of thing. But you're, I mean, it, it cannot be denied that there's no intrinsic physics reason why some of these things in the sky couldn't be alien probes. They could be. So in the end, it really just comes down to, well, how good is the evidence? Now, thoughts on, and again, this is another reason why I pay attention to this now more than I used to, government reports of Navy saying, well, we, we see things that we're not really sure what they are. Have you read those reports and any thoughts on them? Well, I've read the, uh, yeah, the... They're only like three or five pages long, these reports. There have been two that I know of made publicly available, and I've read both of them. Uh, they don't say anything about, actually, about extraterrestrial craft. In fact, in the second report, that possibility isn't even mentioned as far as I can see. But in the first report, it said there was no indication. I think that this is correct. Uh, it, there was no indication of extraterrestrial origin for any of these things that have been seen by the Navy. If you spend a lot of time under the night sky, you will see strange stuff. And I can say, I can report a classic triangle UFO sighting, but I know what it was. It was geese. So when you see geese at night flying in a triangle formation with street lights bouncing off of their bellies, if you didn't know what that was, you could very easily say, I just saw a triangle UFO moving at high speed, but it's only high speed because it's right above you. So I, yep. I, I worry about those types of things. But then I also hear reports from pilots like David Fravor and the Tic Tac. But the problem there is we can't go back to that and see what they saw. So are there cases that give you pause? And that one did for me. But the thing is, I can't go back to 2004 and see what they saw. Can't yeah. measure it. But are yeah. there cases that, that give you pause? Well, that's the one you mentioned is an intriguing case. I mean, you can say, oh, these are pilots. So their witness testimony, which is what the evidence comes down to must be good. But of course, pilots are trained to see other planes. They're not trained to see extraterrestrial craft. And if you look at these reports in detail, it turns out that there are always prosaic explanations for what is being reported. Those, those videos, that, the three Navy videos that made such a splash when they were released, uh, I think it was 2017 or whatever. But in any case, yeah, it might be aliens, but it also might be very prosaic things, like things that are sort of look like they're double lobed, they're like peanuts, and they're rotating and all that sort of thing. But if you have an infrared camera, and that's what these videos were made with, an infrared camera looking straight ahead of your fighter jet, which is again what was being done, and in the distance there's a twin engine 
commercial flight, Southwest Airlines, 50 or 80 miles in front of you, you would see it as a peanut if you use an infrared camera because you, what you're seeing are the uh, engine exhausts from the two engines. So there are prosaic explanations for a lot of this stuff. And I think that that should tell you something. I mean, I, th I think that if we really had alien craft in our skies, you would see it with some of the er various orbiting satellites that we have that making photos, there are like 8,000 of them, making photos of the sky as we see it every day, all day. And they don't seem to report too many aliens. No, and that's very international in nature. So if they're hiding something, you're going to need China, Russia, the United States, Canada, you know, all of these countries to agree to hide it. And I don't think they're going to agree on much of anything. Now, let me ask you this. One thing that bothers me about the reports of that phenomenon gets even deeper with the alien abductions and things like that, which to me begins to blur the line between whatever creates folklore and something else. But what bothers me about them is they usually always are primates, and that's a problem for an alien, right? What are your thoughts <laughs> on what an alien would look like playing with the ideas of convergent evolution? In other words, what could we maybe expect to see if we were standing on an alien world, and what wouldn't we see? And I'll actually answer that question. Yeah, probably not. I, I agree with you. I mean, look, go to the zoo, right? <laughs> go to your local zoo and look at what evolution on Earth has cooked up. And almost nothing in that zoo will look anything like you. I mean, there'll be snakes and fish and stuff like that. They don't look like you. If you go to the primate house, right, you look at the chimps or something, they sort of do look like you. Now, there is convergent evolution. That evolution eventually picks a design that has survival value. That's why fish that are predatory will uh, look like torpedoes because they have to move fast. And if you're built like a torpedo, you can move fast. So there is that sort of thing. I mean, we have eyes. Okay, eyes are very useful. They're found all over nature. And so maybe the ET has eyes. And one eye is good, but two eyes are better because you get depth information. You know, it's 3D and all that sort of thing. Having the eyes high on your body, if you have a head, for example, that's advantageous too because now you can see over the grass and see something that you might want for dinner or whatever. I mean, there are a lot of arguments that you could make. but And, and in fact, one evolutionary biologist Simon Conway Morris in the UK thinks that actually humans represent an optimal design for an intelligent being. I, I don't agree with that, but the only reason I don't agree with it is really that it makes us very special. And I think that if science has taught us one thing over the past couple of centuries, it's that if you think you're special, you're probably wrong. The Copernican principle. Right. Now, well, that actually is, is, is probably the most revealing thing about alien life in the universe that you could imagine, even if you don't directly detect it. You can definitely imagine that factors like gravity are going to fundamentally alter that. So if you've got a super Earth that's got 50 percent more gravity than Earth does, uh, the, the life is probably going to look a lot different as opposed to a tree or something like that that evolved here under the specific conditions and size of this world. So if you get a smaller world that anything would have to be bigger than Mars, but if you get a smaller world, the rules may be different. And if you get a heavier world, the rules are different. And then eventually you get to about two Earth masses, and it doesn't really seem likely that life could do much in an environment like that. But you also run into the, the question of is our most <laughs> is the answer to the great silence that most inhabited worlds are entirely aquatic or something like that, and that we might start to look at these alternative ideas that might be confounding in our search for alien life because alien life simply doesn't do what we do. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's certainly true. You could have a lot of water worlds, which, by the way, wasn't a very good movie, but anyhow. Yeah, you could have, I, I you love have them. Where, <laughs> I like the idea, water worlds, right? Totally covered in oceans. But if you have a world like that, you know, you're probably not going to evolve a species that's technological. I mean, how do you smelt metals if you're on a water world, right? And you can't do radio. There are all sorts of things that water worlds are limited to. It's good to have a little bit of land. <laughs> but Although, a lot of planets. You know, yeah. it has to be said, coral atolls exist on Earth. So life can make its own land in certain conditions, perhaps. I'm sorry, which kind of tools? Coral atolls. Bikini. Oh, coral yeah. atolls. Yeah. So they, if you got a seamount that's getting up there, but not quite, you could, you know, have some sort of evolutionary process that produces uh, an analog of, of coral, and there's your land. <laughs> The, the coral people. Yeah, sounds like a good movie. They never let me make movies for that reason. What's the future now for SETI? What's what's the future for the ATA and SETI Institute? What new instrumentation are you now pursuing to replace what you have now? 
Yeah, well, the Allen Telescope Array, of course, is being constantly upgraded, okay? And the advantage of the Allen Telescope, I mean, it has certain technical advantages consisting of, at the moment, 42 antennas, but it, and, and small antennas, which turns out to be advantageous for some things. And we will continue to upgrade that with better receivers and so forth. One of the big advantages is it's our own telescope, so we can use it any time for whatever purpose we want. The Carl Jansky Telescope, right, the very large array, as it is more commonly known as, uh, in New Mexico. There are 27 antennas, but they're big. And we are trying to use that in a piggyback mode where we sort of siphon off some of the data being collected by that array and, you know, do SETI searches on it. That's a good experiment, too, because that covers a lot of sky. The, uh, you know, the, this, the square kilometer array, which hasn't been built yet, will be even better for SETI, even though it's not being built for SETI. It's just an array that's a kilometer on a side. And again, you can tap off the data and subject them to analysis that would be useful for SETI. So the near-term future seems to me pretty bright because the instruments being used for the radio search keep getting better. The other thing that's promising is that there's more and more attention being paid to other kinds of searches, so-called optical SETI, where you look for flashing laser lights in the sky. There are several programs to do that, and that might be a promising uh, path. Now, what can the listeners do to help the SETI Institute and further the goals of trying to detect alien life? Yeah, well, uh, you know, <laughs> the obvious one, but it's also, it turns out, the most critical one is something that's somewhat prosaic, but it's money. There's no government funding for SETI. It's all done with donations, essentially. So if anybody is really interested in it, the best thing they can do is send a check to the SETI Institute or some other SETI program. And that that would be probably the best thing they could do. Second best, if they don't have any money, tell everybody about the SETI Institute. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, we do. We do a podcast and it's also a broadcast called Big Picture Science. Every week in our show, it's uh, not always about SETI. It's about science in general. Now, Back to the question of detecting alien life. What happens when we do? What are the plans? In other words, you get a signal, it's unambiguous, and you confirm it. I guess you would go on the astronomer's telegram and say, everybody, hey, look, and there it is. So what? how do you tell the public? And again, you, you noted that there is no public funding in the United States anyway for SETI, which is a sordid tale in its own right involving Congress. But <laughs> But the question is, is, do you just go right to the media once once you know? Well, actually, what happens is the media come to us. That's that's actually what happens. I mean, we've had a false alarm, at least one, that was significant in the sense that even we believe that it might be the signal we're looking for. And the newspapers are calling you right away because there's, there's no secrecy in SETI. If you do find a signal, the people involved are all going to be putting that news on their social media and... Uh, you know, the yes, whole world will know we, about we, we've it all seen that. Hours. We've seen that firsthand because you know, scientists cannot keep a secret, <laughs> especially SETI well, scientists. Well, there's well, there's no incentive to keep a secret. I mean, what's the advantage of keeping it secret? I mean, I, I, I've isn't. never heard a convincing case. Yeah, convincing uh, if, case if, or, if you find alien life, you will have all the funding that you want. I it, I think that's true. Yeah, John. Now, my last question before we go is: What do you think of the initiative to get deeper into fast? It seems that the Chinese do have a plan for SETI. Do you have any thoughts on the methodology of, of that experiment and if that could provide a, a sort of a different puzzle piece maybe than to how we do it or have done it since 1960? Well, maybe you have uh, some information about what they're planning to do because I don't know. Tell me that and I'll react. Well, they said that they have a plan, essentially. <laughs> That's about, about the only thing. They're like, yeah, we have a plan. But they do seem to be interested in investing in equipment to do it. So that seems to be on their agenda, but it's I, obviously it's going to be mostly Chinese science. And I don't know how much of that we even see given yeah. the state of the world. All right, Seth, thanks for joining us today. And I hope you'll come back. And I hope next time there's a candidate. Yes. Well, there'll be a candidate, maybe not for SETI, but there'll be candidates. Oh, there'll so. be candidates by that time. Yes. I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.